Canada's achievements in space exploration haven't just been recognized in the scientific community. In this episode, we're talking about how Canada's Department of Communications and NASA earned an Emmy as, quote, one of the most important milestones in Canadian space history. My name is Chad Oman, and welcome to Canadian Space. The Defence Research Telecommunications Establishment, the DRTE, was well established by the time ISIS-2 is launched. To learn more about ISIS, definitely click the button in the top right. <laughs> in the late 1960s, Dr. John H. Chapman wrote his infamous self-titled report, The Chapman Report. In it, he recommended that Canada have its own communications satellite network. This influenced the federal government to establish the Department of Communications in 1969. The government granted the DOC responsibility for the Alouette ISIS program, and the DRTE staff and resources were transferred to become the DOC's research branch, named the Communications Research Centre. The CRC continued to provide the same support to the Department of National Defence as the DRTE did, and still does, but its new mandate focused on civilian communication. Enter Hermes, or better known as the Communication Technology Satellite, CTS, an experimental high-power direct broadcast communication satellite and a joint effort between the DOC, NASA, and the European Space Agency. The DOC designed and managed it. NASA provided a 200-watt traveling wave tube amplifier, environmental testing, and of course launched it. The DOC signed an agreement with ESA to deliver a 1,200-watt solar panel and an amplifier. It was completely assembled, integrated, and tested at the David Florida Laboratory in Ottawa, Ontario. CTS was given the namesake Hermes after the Greek god of science and eloquence. On January 17, 1976, at 7.28 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 17B, the communications technology satellite was launched on a Delta 2914 rocket into a geosynchronous orbit at longitude 116 degrees west. It weighed 680 kilograms or 1,500 pounds at launch and entered service only four months later on May 21, 1976. It operated for three years and 10 months until its last contact was made in November of 1979. In this geosynchronous or geostationary orbit, it surfaced 40% of the Earth's surface. The satellite was meant to test all aspects of a high-powered satellite with large antennas beaming television signals directly to homes equipped with antennas, along with two-way communications with mobile stations. The spacecraft was constructed of a 1.17 meter cylinder with 6.5 meter long solar panels that were extended shortly after it was deployed in orbit. Okay, I've been putting together the elements for this episode and I realized I glossed over a really important individual that was involved in the Hermes program. Spaceflight pioneer Bruce Hakenhead, born September 22nd of 1923 in Didsbury, Alberta. He recently passed away in August of 2019 at the ripe old age of 96. We'll go into Aikenhead's biography in a future episode, but he'd worked on the ISIS-2 project and later on on Hermes with RCA Victor. Here's a great clip of him that I couldn't not include in this month's episode, uh, a courtesy of the Virtual Museum of Canada program. Department of Communications decided that uh, now they were going to build uh, another satellite uh, and with a different job altogether. Uh, it was no longer going to be uh, for the purpose of uh, investigating the upper, the upper atmosphere and doing that kind of technology. They had enough satellites to be able to do that and the ones that we'd already built. Uh, although they were supposed to have a guaranteed life of six months, uh, were still functioning 18 months uh, after uh, they'd been launched and, and uh, so they, there was no shortage of that kind of data. Instead, uh, what they were now uh, going to do was explore uh, the feasibility of uh, having uh, very, very high frequency uh, transmissions, which uh, could be done with tiny uh, reflector dishes. Up until that time, if you had a, a reflector to go with the, the transmitter that you're using and the kind of signals that you're going to pick up, you needed a dish that was six feet or ten feet or so in, in diameter. And there were a few of those that you would see on rooftops of, of buildings and maybe in somebody's backyard. Uh, but now, uh, with this new thing, uh, you could put a, one of these small dishes and attach it to your chimney or the eavesdrop or something of that sort, and this would be uh, good enough to give you a, a very good signal. But uh, more important uh, uh, commercially was the fact that uh, 
at these very, very high frequencies, you could send a great deal more data. Uh, and uh, a newspaper in Toronto uh, could send its, uh, uh, its whole front page to Vancouver, uh, just like that. Hermes was the first communications satellite to take advantage of what's called the KU band, a portion of the electromagnetic spectrum in the microwave range with frequencies ranging from 12 to 18 gigahertz. Today, KU band is used for high bandwidth applications like satellite television, TV network backhauls for remote locations, back to a network studio for editing and broadcasting, International Space Station communications, and SpaceX's new Starlink satellites. The use of this frequency band allows for smaller and more convenient satellite dishes due to the lower wavelength signals. The disadvantage of using KU band frequencies is a noticeable degradation of signal due to what's called rain fade. In many cases, this was mitigated by transmitting higher powered signals, but this requires, of course, higher powered satellites. 37 different experiments were conducted by federal, provincial, private agencies, and organizations, all coordinated with the Department of Communications. These experiments were founded in telemedicine, remote and community education, and television distribution. In all, 27 ground terminals were loaned by the DOC to various experimenters. This included special TV receive-only terminals in isolated and otherwise challenging to service geographies like the Arctic. This experiment very much was the prelude to direct broadcast services that are now available worldwide like satellite television. Hermes made history as the first communication satellite used for video art by artist Keith Sonnier in 1977 in his two-part work named Send Receive Satellite Network. Pretty unique name if you ask me. Video, text, and graphics were fed to the satellite and broadcast across the North American continent. NASA provided a satellite uplink truck for access to Hermes. Saunier produced this production in two phases. Phase one was a critique of satellite technology, examining if it would become accessible to the public as opposed to being exclusive to commercial and military purposes. Phase two featured excerpts of phase one. Its capabilities didn't stop there. The satellite was used in telemedicine for emergency medical services, teleconferencing, and community television. In May of 1978, it televised the National Hockey League's Stanley Cup playoffs to Canadian diplomats in Peru. This was the first direct-to-home satellite television broadcast in the world. These exercises contributed to the creation of the Anik B satellites and served as an underlying platform for more projects to directly broadcast television to consumers. The Annex Satellite Series, or Little Brother in a Nick to it, are also geostationary communication satellites launched and operated by Telesat Canada that are dedicated to television in Canada. 16 Annex satellites have been launched between 1972 and 2013, with nine distinct iterations along the way. Anik B, the successor to Hermes, was devoted to broadcasting CBC Television, CBC Parliamentary Television, CITV, TV Edmonton, CHCA Hamilton, and TV Ontario. At the time, CNCP Telecommunications, a telegraph operator, also used Anik B as a relay for its services. The Globe and Mail also used Anik B to transmit copy to printing plants across Canada. And rest assured, we'll go into depth on the Anik satellite series of geostationary communication satellites in a future episode. And hopefully there's not as many acronyms, because holy man, that was a lot. In July 1979, Hermes was moved to a new location 26 degrees farther west to longitude 142 degrees west. This allowed experiments to be conducted in Australia, specifically in the outback where communications were generally quite tricky due to its sheer geographic size and lack of population density. Overall, the Hermes program was launched to meet the following objectives. To enhance Canada's capability to design and manufacture spacecraft. To develop and flight-proof spacecraft subsystems for use in future communication satellites. To advance space-to-ground communication technology. To flight-proof KU band communications hardware for use in future higher-power communication satellites and for lower-cost ground stations. And to show the social, cultural, and economic impact of the introduction of satellite communications. The Hermes satellite was an incredibly flexible platform for experimentation and met and exceeded all of its objectives. Researchers gathered essential data about rain fade and what would make future communication satellite platforms like ANIC more flexible and ultimately more successful. Hermes was retired in November of 1979 after nearly four years of successful experimentation. Hermes now lies in an inclined parking orbit to free up valuable space in altitudes where geostationary orbit is possible. And of course, 
We can't forget to mention the 1987 Emmy that was awarded to the Department of Communications and NASA, recognizing their joint role in developing KU band satellite technology with the Hermes program. Canadian Minister of Communications Flora MacDonald for Prime Minister Brian Mulroney at the time referred to the Hermes satellite as one of the most important milestones in Canadian space history when she loaned the award for engineering achievement to the National Museum of Science and Technology in Ottawa, Ontario. Stay tuned for the rest of season one, where we'll continue our conversation on some of the other satellites Canada has contributed and what that's meant for innovation in Canada and abroad. Follow Canadian Space on Twitter and at cdnspace.ca. There you'll find transcripts of our episodes and additional resources to continue your own exploration into Canadian Space. If you like what we're doing here and want to contribute financially, head on over to our Patreon page at patreon.com slash cdnspace. Thank you. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and be well.